and apparent my nose is running <laughs> it's okay i just needed it i just didn't want it to dripping down on camera <laughs> thank you i just felt it like the cause and effect of being owned controlled and manipulated Okay, I'm starting this episode from a different location because I wanted to first thank you all for the outpouring of listenership and your thoughtful responses. So based on feedback, I actually want to refine some parts of this episode so you'll see an occasional toggle between environments. Thank you for the grace. Um, At the end of last episode discussing the world having excessive access to child performers' bodies, I mentioned I'd get into body modification. However, It seems I put the cart before the horse, and we need to first get a stronger sense of Hollywood culture overall, so you can understand the environmental context in which all of this is happening. Um, I noticed there's a tendency to blame individual perpetrators. Uh, Some people commented about the sleazy journalists, uh, the creepy crew members, the neglectful parents, the obnoxious fans, uh, your words, not mine. And while, yes, there are absolutely individuals who we need to identify and hold accountable, it oversimplifies the issue if we think cherry-picking, quote-unquote, bad people and tossing them out will fix everything, because the structure's still in place. And trust me, we will get to the parents, we'll get to the fans, paparazzi fame, one topic at a time. But the poison here is not just bad people. The poison is also in the water we're all drinking. Some of the inappropriate or asinine behaviors are partially enabled by and a byproduct of cultural standards that we've inherited as normal. So treat today's episode kind of like a slingshot. We're first pulling back to see more of the landscape, feeling some tension build, and then once we're loaded with helpful info in the coming episodes, boom, we'll launch. Heads up, I'm also going to share a major personal story in this episode, so please listen with care. Okay. Switching locations in three, two. First, Hollywood is a subculture of greater U.S. culture. And wow, what a thing to participate in both. If you haven't yet cracked open the American dream and reckoned with the dysfunction and innate toxicity of U.S. culture and systems, highly recommend reading Gabor Mate's The Myth of Normal, which helps us understand how traits of our current systems and things we claim to be normal in society are actually killing us. He shares fascinating links between the rise we're seeing in disease, chronic illness, mental and physical distress, and cultural norms, such as a more individualistic and isolated lifestyle, higher value placed on materialism and fame or status, neglecting the planet, industries that are designed to addict us to sugar, salt, drugs, tobacco, neuromarketing strategies that keep us glued to our devices and purchasing products, He also shares how disease can link to early childhood experiences where children had to suppress their authentic selves. And this suppression, which leads to a splitting between the authentic self and the acceptable version of yourself that you morph into, legitimately taxes and corrodes the mind and body. So we're all swimming in this water, right? And we haven't even mentioned the data around race, poverty, other forms of marginalization on a person's lifespan and health trajectory. So yes, these alone outside of Hollywood contribute to real suffering and illness we may all experience. Then add Hollywood culture on top of this? Next, Hollywood culture more than a century ago was formed by adults with adults in mind. Nonetheless, one day someone had the grand idea to bring a kid into the movies but didn't think to prep the culture for it. So kids entered an environment not made for kids or with kids in mind. Okay, just picture your seven-year-old heading to your job for the day. Have them do what you do on a daily basis. You know, watch them sit at your desk, reviewing computer docs, rearranging the calendar, taking notes in meetings, uh, troubleshooting problems, managing pylons of last-minute deadlines. It's almost comical to fathom. Think of their attention span to stay with a repetitive task like emails for hours. Think of how well they do plugging in Excel formulas. Tell them they can't pee or have a snack because this meeting goes another one and a half hours. 
Explain to them power dynamics and why you stay silent when the person in the suit speaks, but you can laugh with the person at the desk next to you. And make sure they know that if they don't keep up, they'll be identified as low performing and they'll be off the job. Other employers will refuse to provide positive references, so your future employment's at risk. Well, Hollywood might involve a different set of daily tasks for employees, but it's still an adult workplace with production offices, agendas, bottom lines, and hierarchies. And working on a movie for three months, committing to this schedule every day as a seven-year-old, is just not congruent with the kind of daily experience or life rhythms they'd have in a typical child-oriented environment with other non-professional children. Further, as much as the kids are in the dark on what's happening around them, adults on set are also in the dark when it comes to knowing how to interact with kids. They only usually know to try and be friendly and not cuss. Most production folks assume any matters related to the kids are someone else's job, like the parent or school teacher, which makes it convenient to ignore mishaps. And let's be honest, most people on set aren't child development experts who recognize the responsibility of creating a loving, age-appropriate culture for children. And I don't blame them. That's not their job description. This isn't daycare. It's a warehouse with heavy industrial equipment, and they're the key grip, not a babysitter. Adding to these power dynamics, which are an important thing to keep in mind, Hollywood culture is built on conditioning commercial artists to say yes to any opportunity that comes along. There's such a seemingly scarce supply of work opportunities and such a large pool of people who want the job and will do anything for it. So as a young kid enters the industry, they adapt quickly to saying yes. They say yes to being pulled out of school early for last minute castings. They say yes to late filming hours. They say yes to free gigs in exchange for exposure. Or should I clarify, the parent says yes on the kid's behalf. Because if they say no, Hollywood will just get someone else. And then why are you spending so much time and money supporting their passion if you're not gonna position them to succeed? Moving on to another cultural facet, regulations. There are tons of union standards and programs to support employees. It's just that they're not well regulated or accessible. So I played the role of a child actor on an ABC show, I'm With Her. I know, very meta. So during one scene, I was given a cigarette to hold because they were playing into the child actor trope of being too mature for our age and just already very cynical. Well, I'd never held a cigarette before, and I remember my heart racing, but the adults claimed it was totally fine to pull it up to my mouth because it was an herbal cigarette. Well, my mom and the school teacher couldn't see what was happening to step in because it was a spontaneous, creative idea that wasn't in the script or previous takes. It just seemed like a funny bit that an executive wanted to try. And I remember thinking, I'm not supposed to smoke. I don't want to do this. My family in Ohio are going to be so mad at who I've become. But I didn't feel there was a time or place for me to speak up. And would anyone listen to me, the kid? It wasn't until someone from S&P, Standards and Practices, showed up for a randomized check-in, saw me holding the cigarette, and immediately announced this wasn't allowed, and the cigarette was removed. Now, was it removed because of my safety or just to cover ABC's ass if they showed a kid with a cigarette on camera? I'm not sure. But if not for the random check-in, I would have been left in an unprotective place for inappropriate behavior to happen. And I didn't know my power or agency to self-advocate. I didn't have any signals that if I spoke up, I'd be heard. This is obviously a recipe for not only misconduct, but also abuse. Now, um, I want to mention here an internal experience the kids are having throughout this, which is that when they're participating in the industry, they're in performance mode all day long. So they're experiencing this environment through the state of being a performer, which is different from being your authentic self in a space. So let me explain a little. A part of the beautiful craft of performing is learning how to consciously contort your emotional, psychological, and physical state on cue. It's a profound skill set of storytelling and self-discipline. But when the industry takes up a significant place in our lives, this state of performing begins to dominate your sense of identity. As child performers, we're often removed from settings where we can be our authentic selves, 
like normal school settings, extracurricular activities, etc. So our experiences and the people we're around tend to be affiliated with performance and performing. When the adults in your life are casting directors, acting coaches, showrunners, castmates, their primary focus in interacting with you is as a performer. They're not here to care for you as a whole human or invest in other skill sets outside of performing. And that's not their fault. It's the nature of the gig. But when you zoom out and realize the only aspects of the kid's identity receiving attention is being the performer and that their other personal needs are bypassed, it can be quite hard for a child to ever learn that they're more than the performer. By age 10, I was an industry veteran. Performing was my identity and my surroundings reinforced it. I didn't know myself as anything else. I didn't really know that underneath performing, I was innately lovable and worthy. For these reasons and more, I believe child performers end up unknowingly being conditioned to offer themselves wherever, whenever, to whomever. We don't learn that we have a voice and can say no. And in the worst case scenarios, this does lead to abuse and other harm. Tons of child performers are experiencing categorical abuse, sexually, mentally, emotionally, financially. They're experiencing violence, manipulation. Many of my peers have had managers, music label executives, family members, and other adults around them physically and sexually abuse them, emotionally manipulate them, threaten to ruin their careers, force drugs and other substances on them. And instead of the child knowing they have a voice and how to use it, they become victims suffering silently in ways that will mark their lives and affect their health and relationships forever. I recognize that many children outside the industry experience having their voice silenced, experience abuse and hardship. When you're in environments and situations that dismiss bodily autonomy, it has lasting effects. It's statistically proven that you're more vulnerable to becoming a victim of abuse, being taken advantage of, even just being an extreme people pleaser. Well, since I spoke to all these former kid actors, I asked what the lasting effects have been. How has this shaped the adults we've all become? Why do child actors become broken adults? Media tends to show some of the severe outcomes, right? You see the kid actors who experience addiction and substance abuse, higher rates of mental illness, higher rates of PTSD. And that all aligns with the research that demonstrates how child abuse and childhood trauma increase the likelihood of suffering in these ways. But I also want to get more nuanced and more personal. Starting with how being conditioned to be obedient and submissive can lead to you becoming an adult who's more easily taken advantage of and controlled. This pattern of submission might repeat itself in other domains of life, like romantic relationships, maybe finding yourself in abusive dynamics, or, you know, maybe it's even in spaces like church congregations where rigid obedience and punishment are prescribed as the pathways of uprightness. Next, uh, and we've named this a bit already, trust for former kid actors is just really hard. We tend to have fewer trusted relationships overall. Between the yes men around us and clout chasers that come in and out, we just don't know people's motives and a lot of us have been burned over and over again. I've been working really hard on learning how to trust and I'm finding that it also starts with rebuilding trust with myself. I have to build the belief that I'm capable of looking out for myself, which is hard to adopt after you're taken advantage of repeatedly. You know, without leaning too far into self-blame here, I started to wonder if I was a safe and reliable keeper of my own mind and body. Speaking of being taken advantage of, an outcome that I see a lot for former kid actors is having little to no grasp of our own business affairs. Teams of people come in really early and they control all these things. So all we have to do is show up, hit our mark, and perform. Many of us never learn the basics of business management. This can lead to very poor financial decisions and hardship later. And it leaves room for people to mess with our money without us even realizing. 
I haven't spoken about this much, but this did happen to me, even though I was convinced that my team, my family were totally protecting my finances. While I was touring my original music, I learned that I had zero dollars left in one of my bank accounts, which made no sense because I was ultra frugal and I'd been working since childhood. There should have been, honestly, like close to half a million in there. But when I investigated everything, I discovered my former business team and other adults in my life had organized a plan where they were paying themselves extra money from this one account since I was a kid. And apparently, as a kid, I had agreed to that, but you know I didn't understand what was happening. And years later, even after they weren't involved in my business like before, and even after my work slowed down and I wasn't making nearly as much money, they continued paying themselves the same amount from this account. They never checked in to see if adult Allison was still okay with this setup, and unfortunately, adult Allison didn't have the financial literacy or diligence to figure out this problem until it was too late. I thought I was reviewing statements correctly. I thought I was doing okay with understanding my business affairs. I definitely was not, and I didn't catch this. That was a really low moment. Um, So I want to keep sharing some of my own adult struggles that I believe stem from this early cultural conditioning. Uh, This one in particular might be a little bizarre. Just go with me. For me, the lack of bodily autonomy has shown up in this pattern of self-neglect over the years. I didn't really learn how to take care of myself or value my health and well-being in like really basic ways because I associated all the self-care habits with being on camera or in performance mode. I remember when I stepped away from the industry, I had the hardest time remembering to brush my teeth and comb my hair. I didn't have the motivation to work out because there wasn't going to be an audience seeing my weight. And whenever I wasn't on set, I looked like a disheveled mess because I only did these things for industry purposes. At least, you know, that's how my kid brain made sense of it. That's how I'm making sense of it so far. Not only did I not develop these habits for myself, I also had professionals who took care of most of these things for me, which is so strange. There was a wardrobe person laying out my outfit for every day, a hair and makeup team helping me look beautiful, a whole crew ensuring I looked like a superstar. I just needed to roll out of bed and show up. Well, cut to me in my late 20s, still having to write brush teeth on my calendar, trying to put together an outfit that isn't sweatpants, and remembering that I can't just work until I collapse in exhaustion every night. I have to give myself 10 minutes to wash my face and brush my teeth and drink water. Why is this the hardest thing I've ever done in life? Building on self-neglect, another form of this was just that I became a master chameleon in all spaces. This has been really sad to face, but thankfully, I'm finally finding my own self. Um, But just as I grew up constantly auditioning and shape-shifting as different characters, I totally carried that into every other area of my life. My romantic relationships have been such an example of me shape-shifting to be whatever the person needs and prefers, whether that's trying to present myself in a way they'll think is beautiful, my hair and nails and fashion, or like literally changing my personality and sense of humor and stances on things. I've been master accommodator, whatever the other person in the room wants and needs. I don't need anything. I have no preferences, no identity, just a mirror of you. I'm easy to be around, easy to work with, forever likable, never a burden. And I think some of this shape-shifting, you know, is normal as you're growing up and experimenting with who you are, but it seems like we former kid actors tend to have a pretty extreme version of this. It's taken me until 30 to recognize that I can never truly feel seen and known and accepted and loved for who I am if I never let myself be seen and known authentically, including to myself. But I just learned since childhood to disguise my real feelings and remain presentable and positive. Well, um... I do want to let this segue into something more serious for a moment. Um, The part about just complying and being whatever people want, not thinking of my own well-being, has played a role in a few key traumatic experiences I've had as an adult. So 
trigger warning. One of them happened when I was unknowingly groomed by a person in power. It started at an influencer event and then continued over subsequent days during meetings with him that were painted as business opportunities. In hindsight, I realized I felt very uncomfortable in several moments early on, and several inappropriate things happened, and different tactics of power and manipulation were used. But in the moment, I either froze or fawned, and I didn't know what to do, and it was all escalating so quickly. Well, it culminated when he invited me to visit his product lab, and upon arrival, he raped me. I know that it wasn't my fault. I know that his actions are not okay. It's never okay to enact violence. I really do. And simultaneously, I do wish that I had a different sense of self-empowerment and self-advocacy going into that set of experiences. So from that moment on, I have absolutely prioritized reclaiming my personal agency and my right to basic safety. Sure, this doesn't entirely eliminate the possibility of something else happening beyond my control, but I do feel much more equipped to handle what's within my control differently. I do want to add a little more to this because I just disclosed a really heavy thing and there's a lot more to the story for another time, maybe a book. But I later learned that this person has more than a dozen other people, and that's a conservative number, by the way, who have endured the same violence, the same tactics. And this person is still walking around doing the same things. Even after we tried to come forward, this person was greeted with smiles, hugs, and high fives by the people around us when I met him. He was vouched for by mutual connections who I thought were trustworthy. So imagine, he's one person. Now there's a sea of people at each of these Hollywood or influencer get-togethers, and the culture receives them with smiles, hugs, and high fives. And your seven-year-old, full of hope, walks into the room, completely unaware of whose hand they're shaking. Smiles, hugs, and high fives. Okay. So uh, I know that was a lot, and really the picture I'm trying to paint is that these early experiences and industry dynamics have had a real lasting impact on all areas of my life. The particular theme of body ownership, it really boils down to knowing or not knowing your agency, your power, your capacity for resilience. And this is absolutely a key area that I want to improve for current and future generations. I want young artists to know their own voice and how to use it. And of course, I want safer industry conditions for children to exist in. Now that we've focused on body ownership and you know, what it's like to feel disempowered, I actually want to flip all of this upside down and talk about the opposite experiences of power and child stardom. As in what it's like to accrue wealth, status, and power, and how that drastically shapes a kid actor's psychological development. Yes, this is all so layered. It's such a roller coaster. I get it. And yes, I promise I'm still going to circle back to body image and body modifications. I'll tell you about going to rehab and plastic surgeries that I've had that I never talked about. So just stick with me. Savor these incredibly raw and personal stories. And... um. Just wait for what I'm sharing next. I'll see you there. On the next episode. And you walk in and your co-star squeals to greet you, handing you a drink because you're just in time for the first toast. You may not drink it, but suddenly there's alcohol in your hand and you know that's illegal. The older teenagers ask if you want to go do a line in the bathroom to get the night going. You don't know what kind of line in the bathroom they're referring to, but you respond that you don't have to pee and you walk towards the DJ to dance. 